Hi. Deliverance from the wicked. Psalms 58, 11. So that man will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. Let this one great, gracious, glorious fact lie in your spirit until it permeates all your thoughts and makes you rejoice, even though you are without strength. Rejoice that the Lord Jesus has become your strength and your song. He has become your salvation. Charles Persian. Deliverance from the wicked. Want to know more? Hang around. Welcome. Welcome to Lions Roar 3 8. Amos 3 8 tells us a lion has roared. Who will not fear? The Lord God has spoken. Who can but prophesy? Welcome, my name is George Magalhães and we are an apostolic ministry with a prophetic teaching edge. It is our passion, our mission to reignite, equip and release Christ-like disciples both locally and globally. We do that through our itinerant ministry but as well as providing you with resources just like this one to help you, to aid you in your God-given calling. Today I want to talk to you about Deliverance from the wicked. Deliverance from the wicked. I love this. And we are going to continue on the series of what? Of Psalms. So we're going to continue on the series of Psalms. We've gone through Psalms 27. We've gone through Psalms 57. And today we're going to go through Psalms 58. Psalms 58. But before we do that, because they're a part of a group of Psalms, the Do Not Destroy group. Um, so I encourage you to go back, if you haven't already, go back to the other two that we've covered and then come back and listen to this one as well. Amen? Um, but that leads us to our main verse. What is our main verse today? Our main verse comes... From the book of Psalms, Psalms 58, let me bring it up for you, and it says, So that men will say, surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely he is God who judges in the earth. Psalms 58 verse 11 in the voice translation tells us, And it will be heard, those who seek justice will be rewarded. Indeed, there is a God who brings justice to the earth. Amen? Glory to God. Just like the other ones, I want to give you a little context first. I want to give you some background, definitions, information, resources, um, key components that we need to take into account before we get into Psalms 58, before we start breaking it down. You ready? Okay. So the title, the title of this psalm is The Just Judgment of the Wicked. The Just Judgment of the Wicked. To the chief musician set to do not destroy. A michtam or a miktam of David. Again, let me go back for those that haven't listened to this before. What is a michtam? What is a miktam? A miktam is a transliteration, often translated as a poem a prayer, or a song. It's the word golden, to stamp or to engrave for preservation. A psalm precious as stamped gold or golden ornament. Or go golden ornament. Now, do not destroy. Charles Spurgeon noted there are arguably, as I was saying before, four, arguably four of these do not destroy Psalms. Yes, I included Psalms 27 in there, but arguably it's not part of it. There are arguably four of these do not destroy Psalms. Noticeably, the 57th, 58th, which we're going to cover today, 59th and 75th. In all of them, there is a distinct declaration of the destruction of the unrepentant, wicked, unrepentant, 
That is the key here. Let me say that again. In all of them, there is a distinct declaration of the destruction of the unrepentant wicked and the preservation of the righteous. Amen. Although David had his own case in his mind's eye, yet he wrote not as a private person, but as an inspired prophet. And therefore his song is presented for public and perpetual use. So for you and me. The wicked are here judged and condemned. But over the godly, the sacred destroy not is solemnly pronounced. Charles Persian. Okay. So let's look at the key components. There are two main sections. There are two main sections to Psalms 58. Let me just take that out of the way. Two main sections. Okay, there is the charges of the wicked. So that's Psalms 58, verses 1 to 5. The charges of the wicked. And then we have the second section, which is the judgment of the wicked. Psalms 58, verses 6 to 11. The judgment of the wicked. In section 1, in the charges of the wicked, Psalms 58, verses 1 to 2, we see a challenge to the wicked. A challenge to the wicked. David finds them out, exposing their evil actions and intents. Psalms 58, verses 3 to 5, we see a description of the wicked rulers. David diagnoses the degree of evil to the very roots. So, section 2 now. Section 2, that is Psalms 58, verses 6 to 11. So, Psalms 58, 6 to 8, we see the sentencing called for. So, we see the sentencing called for. David specifies and calls for the appropriate sentencing for the accused, unrepentant, wicked. Psalms 58, 9 to 11, we see the satisfaction of the foreseen judgment. The satisfaction of the foreseen judgment. David expresses his satisfaction and eventual joy on the fitting, just judgment of the wicked. James B. Kaufman. James B. Kaufman had a commentary and he noted it this way. It expresses, so Psalms 58, it expresses a sevenfold curse upon evil men and mentions the rejoicing of the righteous that such a judgment will actually fall upon the wicked. It is only a very foolish, naive and immature type of righteous person who is unable to find in his soul an element of rejoicing and thanksgiving at the biblical prospect of the final utter overthrow of wickedness. Should God allow that evil being unlimited freedom to continue his evil assault upon mankind indefinitely? Or should God put the hook in his nose and drag him to the death and destruction that he deserves? This is the great question. God has already told us how it will be answered. The punishment of the wicked is an incidental thing altogether to the overthrow of Satan. Hell, with all its implications of terror, described in the Bible under many metaphors, was never designed for evil men, but only for Satan and the fallen angels who supported him. Christ died on Calvary to prevent any man from ever suffering the fate of Satan. Amen? Well said. Glory to God. That takes us to Psalms 58. As usual, we're going to break it down, and we're going to break it down from uh, uh, together from different Bible 
versions. It's good when you study the Word of God to, to, to look and to study it from different uh, or various or as many Bible translations as possible. It helps you. It assists you as well. And that means we're going to be starting from the Amplified Classic Version, from the Message Version, from the New King James Version, from the Passion Translation, and from the Voice Version. You ready? Because this is a goodie. All right, let's start. Verse 1 in the New King James Version. It says, Do you indeed speak righteousness, you silent ones? Do you judge uprightly, you sons of men? In the voice translation, it says it this way. Can you, panel of judges, get anything right? When you judge people, do you tell the truth and pursue justice? You see, David directed this psalm to those who were rulers, leaders in authoritative positions of dominance and impact, quite possibly Saul's advisors, the leaders that were influential in the judgment passed upon the fugitive David, condemning him to a death sentence as a traitor. Whether active or silent, it is these unrepentant, wicked rulers that David challenges, and the uprightness of their decisions. It's quite likely, likely David was shocked at the corruption because he now felt the sting of it. You know, unfortunately, it's only when it personally affects us that we begin to care about authoritative and or government corruption. Charles Persian noted, some of those who surrounded Saul were rather passive than active persecutors. They held their tongues when the object of royal hate was slandered. In the original, this first sentence appears to be addressed to them. And they are asked to justify their silence. Silence gives consent. He who refrains from defending the right is himself an accomplice, uh, accomplice in the wrong. Have you not put aside all truth when ye have condemned the godly and united in seeking to overthrow the innocent? Yet in doing this, be not too sure of success, for ye are only sons of men. And there is a God who can and will Reverse your verdicts. Amen and amen. The message version says it this way. Is this any way to run a country? Is this any way to run a country? Is there an honest politician in the house? Let's continue to verse 2. The New King James Version in verse 2. No, in heart you work wickedness. You weigh out the violence of your hands in the earth. The message version expresses it this way. Behind the scenes you weave webs of deceit. Behind closed doors you make deals with demons. It's a goodie today, I told you. As Charles Persian noted, and I'm paraphrasing. The psalmist did not say they had wickedness in their heart. But they did work it there. Willingly consenting. They are deliberate sinners. Cold, calculating villains. As righteous judges ponder the law, balance the evidence and weigh the case. So the malicious dispense injustice with malice of forethought in cold blood. Dietrich Bonhoeffer. Look him up. Especially for the times we're living in today. There's a lot we can learn from this man. Dietrich Bonhoeffer, and yes, he was a Christian minister, perfectly noted 
the great masquerade of evil has played havoc with all our ethical concepts. For evil to appear disguised as light, charity, historical necessity or social justice is quite bewildering to anyone brought up on our traditional ethical concepts. While for the Christian who bases his life on the Bible, it merely confirms the fundamental wickedness of evil. The Passion Translation says it this way. Not one. You only give justice in exchange for a bribe. For the right price, you let others get away with murder. Mm. Verse 3. In the New King James Version. The wicked are estranged from the womb. They go astray as soon as they are born, speaking lies. The voice version says it this way. Evil doers are naturally offensive, wayward at birth. They were born telling lies and willfully wandering from the truth. You see, David diagnosed their evil to the very root of the problem. Their very nature, using the origin of the womb, their birth, as a symbolic picture of the gravity, degree of their evil, and willingness for wickedness from the very moment of conception. Charles Spurgeon noted it. To be untruthful is one of the surest proofs of a fallen state. And since falsehood is universal, so also is human depravity. There is a sense that David was also warning all humanity to look within. It is not a picture of a portrait as such, but a mirror upon which we all all must observe ourselves and if need be turn from our wicked ways the passion translation says it this way wicked wanderers even from the womb that's who you are remember he's not talking to us he's talking to the wicked unrepented wicked people you following Okay, let's continue. Verse 4. Verse 4 in the New King James Version. He goes on. Their poison. Now he's explaining. He's expressing. He's detailing. Specifying how they are. Their poison is like the poison of a serpent. They are like the deaf cobra that stops its ear. The mes message. Message. Must be a new, a new version. The message version says it this way. Poison, lethal rattlesnake poison, drips from their forked tongues. David emphasizes the greater affliction these unrepentant, wicked leaders can impose through their lies. The power they possess to inflict a deadlier oppression upon their subjects. Their authority, expertise, influence and power makes them even more vicious, even more dangerous. Likened to a deaf, unpredictable, dangerously deadly cobra. The Passion Translation says it this way. You lie with your words and your teaching is poison. Must be something my today. Verse 5. <laughs> the New King James Version. It is a goodie. The New King James Version. Which will not heed the voice of charmers. Remember what he was saying. You are like deaf cobras who don't want to listen to the charmers. Who will not heed the voice of charmers. Charming ever so skillfully. The Passion Translation says it this way, like cobras closing their ears to the most expert of the charmers, you strike out against all who are near. 
They can't be reasoned with. They are not willing to listen. And any opposing narrative is met with a threatening, poisonous lies and brutal force. As Charles Persian noted, again, it is not in your music, but in the sinner's year that, that the cause of failure lies. And it is only the power of God that can remove it. No, we call and call and call in vain. Fill the arm of the Lord is revealed. Till, sorry, till the arm of the Lord is revealed. This is at once the sinner's guilt and danger. He ought to hear, but will not. And because he will not, he cannot escape the damnation of hell. David uses the symbolic picture of a skilled snake charmer who is able to sway the cobra to his own way. However, even the most skillful of them all will stand no chance with these wicked leaders. That's what he's saying. The message version says it this way, deaf to threats, deaf to charm, decades of wax built up in their ears. Verse 6. Verse 6. In the New King James Version. Break their teeth in their mouth, O God. Break out the fangs of the young lions, O Lord. You seem too excited today, George. Told you it was a goodie. <laughs> the Message Version. Verse 6. The Message Version says it this way. God, smash their teeth to bits. Leave them, t leave them toothless tigers. If they have no capacity for good, at least deprive them of their ability for evil. Charles Spurgeon. David petitions the Lord to disarm the wicked, liken to snakes and lions for their fierce cruelty. Their fangs would execute the highest form of damage, hence his plea to leave them toothless. No good God will stand by watching this malicious, deceptive wickedness to triumph. No, no, no. God's justice will come upon them with such furious wrath, making them an example to the world while the righteous rejoice in victory. Amen? Wait, I'll get there. I know what some of you are thinking. I'll get there. You see, because God is absolutely good. He absolutely hates evil. Where does it say there in the Bible? Okay. Proverbs 6, 16 to 19. Proverbs Proverbs 8, 13, Psalm 5, verse 5, Psalm 7, verse 11, Psalm 11, verse 5, Zechariah 8, verse 17, Romans 12, verse 9, Amos 5, verse 15, Isaiah 61, verse 8, Revelation 21, verse 8, etc., etc., Therefore, when he executes justice, he goes for the root of the problem. Sin, evil itself, and the wicked succumb to their own wickedness. 2 Peter 3.9 tells us that the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some count slackness, but is long-suffering towards us. Not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So the voice version of verse 6 says it this way. O oh God, shatter their teeth in their mouths. Render the young lions harmless. Break out their fangs, O eternal one. Very quiet today. <laughs> 
Verse 7, New King James Version. Let them flow away as waters which run continually. When he bends his bow, let his arrows be as if cut in pieces. The Amplified Classic Version says it this way. Let them melt away as water which runs on a pace. When he aims his arrows, let them be as if they were headless or split apart. Like running streams whose waters are swiftly gone, so let them pass away. Or like water split which none can find again, so let them vanish out of existence. Be gone, ye foul streams. The sooner ye are forgotten, the better for the universe. Charles Spurgeon. You see, David's words selection, the selection of his words were intentional in the urgency to be ridden of his wicked persecutors, to be troubled no more. The message version says it this way. Let their lives be buckets of water spilled. All that's left, a damp stain in the sand. Let them be trampled grass, worn smooth by the traffic. <laughs> Glory to God. Amen. Verse 8. Verse 8. In the New King James Version, let them be like a snail which melts away as it goes, like a stillborn child of a woman, that they may not see the sun. Yes, this is in the Bible, people. Read it. It's there. The Amplified Classic Version says it this way. Let them be as snail dissolving slime as it passes on or as a festering sore which wastes away. Like the child to which a woman gives untimely birth that has not seen the sun. Again, Charles Persian noted, As the snail makes its own way by its slime and so dissolves as it goes, or as its shell is often found empty, as though the inhabitant had melted away, so shall the malicious eat out their own strength while they proceed, proceed upon their ma let me say that mal malevolent malevolent designs and shall themselves disappear to destroy himself by envy and chagrin is the portion of the ill disposed hey don't blame me that's the language that they they used in those days charles Spurgeon time Yet it makes a lot of sense. Go back to it, listen to it, and you'll get the picture. You see, again, David's choice of words signifies the urgent seriousness of this matter at hand. And he's expecting outcome of these wicked rulers. There will be no legacy. There will be no legacy. Just as Dain for their very existence. Even their mothers can't wait to forget them fast enough. Ouch, that is very, very a strong, provocative thing, thing to say, George. Wait, I'm getting there. I'm getting there. The voice translation says it this way. Let them melt like a snail that oozes along. May they be like a stillborn that never catches its first breath, never sees the sun. I'm getting there. I know what you're thinking. Verse 9, New King James Version. Before your pots can fill the burning thorns, he shall ta take them away as with a whirlwind, as in his living and burning wrath. The Amplified Classic Version says it this way, Before your pots can fill the thorns that are placed under them for fuel, he will take them away as with a whirlwind, the green and the burning ones alike. You see, before they even light up the fuel for their feast, before the heat begins to rise up the pot, before they begin to rejoice, 
God's justice will come upon them so rapidly and powerfully, it will scatter them and their plans everywhere, revealing their lies, deceit, wickedness, and failure to all, leaving nothing unturned. The malicious wretch puts on his great seething pot. He gathers his fuel. He means to play the cannibal with the godly. But he reckons without his host, or rather without the Lord of hosts, and the unexpected tempest removes all trace of him and his fire and his feast, and that in a moment, Charles Spurgeon. Verse 9. Verse 9 in the Passion Translation says it this way, God will see, sweep them away so fast that they'll never know what hit them. Amen. 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 Verse 10, New King James Version. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. The righteous shall rejoice when he sees the vengeance. He shall wash his feet in the blood of the wicked. Yes. The voice translation says it this way. Cheers will rise as the right living watch him settle the score. Their feet washed in the blood after the onslaught of the wicked. Do you notice here that David says vengeance, not revenge. And bam, there it is. What do they say? The, the coin just dropped or something like that. There it is. There it is. That's what you were waiting for. David did not say revenge. He said vengeance. We are not to rejoice in the revenge of any human beings, no matter how wicked and evil they may be. Vengeance is mine and recompense, says the Lord. Deuteronomy 32 verse 35. But gratefully, but gratefully rejoice in God's victory over evil. Deliverance from the wicked. Justice triumphant. It is a testimony worthy of frequent celebration and remembrance. That's why I get excited. That's why I... I feel excited about this, not about revenge, about justice. Gratefully rejoicing in God's victory over evil, deliverance from the wicked, justice triumphant. It is the testimony worthy of frequent celebration and remembrance. Amen. Charles Spurgeon put it this way. He shall triumph over them. They shall be so utterly vanquished that their overthrow shall be final and fatal. And his deliverance complete and crowning. The damnation of sinners shall not mar the happiness of saints. Amen. Amen. The Passion Translation says it this way. The godly will celebrate in the triumph of good over evil. And the lovers of God will trample the wickedness of the wicked under their feet. Amen. Hallelujah. We're almost finished. Verse 11. Which is our main verse. In the New King James Version, it says, So that man will say, Surely there is a reward for the righteous. Surely. He is God who judges in the earth. The Amplified Version, Amplified Classic Version says, Man will say, surely there is a reward for the uncompromisingly righteous. Surely there is a God who judges on the earth. David's faith is clearly evident in his concluding statement. Surely God will not allow the wicked to triumph over the righteous. Surely he will deliver us from the wicked. Surely God's kingdom rule 
remains supreme. Surely the moral order under God where righteousness is rewarded and the wickedness is judged is at work. He longed to let everyone know, rest assured, we win. Amen? We win. We win. God is on our side. We win. Again, Charles Spurgeon noted, The godly are not after all forsaken and given over to the enemies. The wicked are not to have the best of it. Truth and goodness are recompensed in the long run. There is a God and there is a reward for the righteous. Time will remove doubts, solve difficulties and reveal secrets. Meanwhile, faith's foreseeing eye descends the truth even now and is glad thereat. Be glad we are on the side of the truth. We win. We win. We win. The voice translation says it this way, and it will be heard. Those who seek justice will be rewarded. Indeed, there is a God who brings justice to the earth. Amen and amen and amen. Amen. I love this poem from John Newton. It says, Though troubles assail and dangers affright, Though friends should all fail and foes all unite, Yet one thing secures us, whatever betide, The scripture assures us the Lord will provide. You need justice? The Lord will provide provide. You need healing? The Lord will provide. You need a husband? The Lord will provide. You need a job? The Lord will provide. You need an escape? The Lord will provide. So, Psalms 42 verse 5, so why are you down in the dumps, dear soul? Why are you crying the blues? Fix my eyes on God. Soon I'll be praising again. He puts a smile on my face. He's my God. Let me finish with a quote again from Charles Persian. Let this one great, gracious, glorious fact lie in your spirit until it permeates all your thoughts and makes you rejoice even though you are without strength. Rejoice that the Lord Jesus has become your strength and your song. He has become your salvation. Hallelujah! I know many of you today here have given your life to God. You've received your salvation. But if you haven't, this is your opportunity. Don't muck around. There's no time to muck around. This is your time. The Word of God tells us, John 3.16 For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Romans 10 verse 9 goes on to say that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised Him from the dead, you will be saved right there where you are. And then he goes on to say, then he goes on to say, in Matthew 28, verse 19, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. How do we do that? What's that about? That's the mission. That is the purpose that you and I have. God's created you for a specific purpose. And that is that, is that purpose. We are just passing through, as the Bible tells us. We are aliens to this earth. We are not human beings, a body with a spirit. No, we're spirit beings, as the Word of God says. We were created in His image. 
in his likeness, in the likeness of God himself and God his spirit. So we are spirit beings with a human body. We're passing through. We have a mission here on earth to reveal the good news to the world, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. How do we do that, George? Acts 1 verse 8. But I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you and you will be filled with power. Yes, real power. And you will be my messengers to Jerusalem, throughout Judea, the distant provinces, even to the remotest places on earth. Don't waste any more time right now. What we're going to do is remember what the Word of God says. If you believe, if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus, you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus as your Savior and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead. But Lord, I don't, but George, I don't really have any faith right now. It's a decision. It's your willingness. You make a decision to believe. God will give you the faith you need. He will. Make that decision right now. That's all it takes. I'm going to pray, and if you want to repeat after me, you can do that. And right after I do that, I'm going to pray for you. I'm going to pray for you to, be re to, to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit because that's what it is right there as you see. I promise you this, the Holy Spirit will come upon you. That's called the baptism of the Holy Spirit and fire. He comes with power. He comes with fire. Our God is a consuming fire as His Word says. And He'll come and He'll come and He's live inside of you and He'll be, he'll be your... He's the very Spirit of God. He'll be your comforter. He'll be your teacher. He'll be your pastor. He'll be your whatever you need. He'll be there. And He will teach us and guide us and, 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 and lead us through life so that we may become more and more like Jesus. So it's no longer us that lives, but Christ that lives in us and through us. Amen? Let's go. Let's pray. You ready? Lord, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus. I thank you for my brother and sister that are listening right now. I thank you that they have made the decision to be restored back to you, Lord. Right now, in Jesus' name, as I pray, let them pray with me. And let them receive your presence. Let them receive you, Lord, into their lives. Forgive me, Lord, of all my sin. I no longer want to live without you. And I confess with my mouth the Lord as my Lord and Savior from this day forward. And I choose to believe in my heart that God raised him from the dead. And I am now victorious over sin and death. Like Jesus. Like Jesus, I am co-heirs with Christ. I am restored to the kingdom of God. From this day forward, I'm a new creation in Christ Jesus. Lord, I pray for my brother and my sister that are listening right now. In the mighty name of Jesus, as Christ himself done, he told them to wait for the Holy Spirit. Right now, in the mighty name of Jesus, I pray over them. And I say with faith, Lord, receive the Holy Spirit. I breathe the breath of life over them. Receive the Holy Spirit. And I thank you, Lord, that you sent fire. Send your spirit and send fire, fire, fire in Jesus' name. Empower them right now. Some of you may be feeling some symptoms right now, like electricity running through your body, like a heat or like a weight being lifted off. Some of you may not be feeling anything, but God, God, the Word of God says that those that are hungry and thirsty shall be filled. So you're hungry, you're thirsty. He's filling you right now with His presence. He's filling you right now with His presence. Don't be afraid. And the Word of God says that He also comes with power. And that includes gifts of the Spirit, including the gift of speaking in tongues, which is a, a, a evidence of, of uh, the baptism of fire, baptism of the Holy Spirit. So if you feel like something is bubbling inside of you right now, like you want to speak, just open your mouth. Even if it sounds like gibberish. It is not junk. It's a spiritual language that God created us to, to, to speak with Him. It's our intimate, powerful, 
powerful language that not even the enemy and his demons can understand. Speak it. Speak it out. It will empower you. It will fill you with boldness and courage and strength and everything that you need. Hallelujah, Lord. I thank you for my brothers and sisters. Welcome to the kingdom family. Hallelujah. The Lord of the Word of God says that every time a soul is saved, there is a party in heaven. That the angels and God rejoices with a party for every soul that gets restored back to Him. So I encourage you, please get connected with the church. It is important that you connect with other believers. So you get connected with the church. If you cannot get connected personally, get connected online at the moment until you can get connected personally. Connected with a church that is uh, that teaches the Bible, that is that is filled with Bible teaching, filled with the Holy Spirit, so that you can continue to grow, so that you can also serve others, so you can encourage each other. You're able to serve. You're able to grow in your spiritual gifts. You're able to do what God's called you to do. We need each other. We need the body of Christ. Amen. Congratulations once again. Let me finish with a prayer and then we'll get on to our second section of our program. Section, the second section of our program is what we call the collective. The collective is when I spend some time with those that are online while either watching or listening. And I pray for you. I, I allow the Holy Spirit to move. I pray for you. I prophesy. Whatever the Holy Spirit leads me. If you have specific prayer requests, make sure you write them down already. Sometimes for whatever reasons. Um, Facebook takes a while for it to, to catch up with it. So make sure you, you do write them down. Uh, but let's get to our final prayer. Lord, I'm going to make a declaration prayer. Say, so Lord, I thank you in the mighty name of Jesus for this word today. I thank you that you keep giving us revelation, wisdom and revelation through this word. That you continue to, 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 to just... Uh, reignite our faith and our fire and our zeal and our passion for you more and more each day and for your living word. I thank you, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. We thank you, Lord, as 1 Corinthians 15, 57 says, we thank you for giving us the victory as conquerors through our Lord Jesus, the Anointed One. We declare Matthew 6, 33, that we will seek first your kingdom and your righteousness and all these things, all our needs, will be provided. Galatians 5.1, it was for freedom that Christ set us free. Therefore, we will keep standing firm and not be subject again to a yoke of slavery. We declare Galatians 5.22, that we will live in the Spirit and we will follow you, Lord. We will grow, produce everlasting fruit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. And finally, we declare Philippians 3, 14 to 16, that we will run straight for the divine invitation of reaching the heavenly goal and gaining the victory prize through the anointing of Jesus. Yes, as we fully mature, may we all have this same passion, Lord. And if anyone is not yet gripped by these desires, God reveal it to them. For we shall all advance together to reach this victory prize following one path with one passion. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray for yours is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And that takes us to the collective. So it's time for the collective. 